This is David Bain, who served in the United States Army from 1961 to 1982. This interview is taking place in his home in New Salem, New York, on May 3, 2005, at 10.30 in the morning. This interview is being conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter. What is your full name, and when and where were you born? My name is uh, David Baim. Uh, I was born in Easton, Pennsylvania, 4 December 1938. And what did you do before you entered the Army? Well, basically, uh, my high school days uh, were at Milne School in, in uh, Albany. Uh, summers I spent I spent uh, time as a counselor, a camp counselor, for uh, four years. After that, uh, I went on to uh, Pennsylvania Military College, which is not existed anymore, uh, where I uh, had uh, uh, in my mind here. ROTC. Oh, yeah, ROTC. I took ROTC at, at uh, Pennsylvania Military College and, and graduated as a, a distinguished military graduate. And then where did you go after you left college? Uh, immediately after college, I was uh, directed to, uh, to, uh, to Fort Benning, Georgia which was uh, one week after, after gradu graduating from, uh, from college. So uh, then I went to uh, basic uh, training at, uh, at Fort Benning, uh, which included, uh, this was infantry training, uh, and I also uh, qualified as a parachute uh, uh, person. Uh, I took five jumps at... Uh, at the Fort what Manning. was that first jump like? It was uh, uh, the uh, the NCOs. Uh, I guess everyone realizes that uh, they, uh, they they get you ready for uh, jumping, and by the time that the airplane goes up, uh, you know they have you so wired uh, that uh, you'd probably leap off the Empire State Building, you know, uh, if you had to, just to get away from those. <laughs> Those guys. So it was it was no problem whatsoever. All five uh, all five jumps uh, were were easy, and I didn't uh, wind up in some field anywhere, you know, or tree or anything. It was uh, it was interesting, but uh, those guys helped helped me really do that job or, mm -hmm. or forget about uh, my problems. And you didn't whereas, want to make a career of parachute jumping. Uh, I. I would have, I guess, uh, if uh, if I had been assigned to uh, a unit that uh, that was airborne, but I, I never never became assigned or never was assigned to an airborne division. Or when unit. you entered the army, were you commissioned immediately? Yes, I what was, was commissioned a second lieutenant. Yes. What kind What kind of training did you go through uh, when you first came in? At Fort Benning, yes. Well, of course, in ROTC, I, I, I went through all the uh, all the training which led up to uh, becoming a second lieutenant. And basically, uh, uh, the the first assignment at Fort Benning was uh, learning the, the the basics of infantry training. Uh, you know how to move a uh, a squad, a platoon, uh, whatever. Uh, whatever you were put in charge of. Uh, uh, there was, of course, there was firing all types of weapons, which I had never done previously other than a rifle. Uh, so we fired mortars and uh, everything else that the in infantry uh, you know, were responsible for. Mm -hmm. And then where did you uh, go after that? Uh, after Fort Benning, I was signed to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, which is a Army training center. 
and uh, initially um, I was a executive for one of the companies and then uh, within uh, within a, two months I became the company commander uh, of a training company uh, at that at that location there was a uh, the the company that I particularly res was responsible for was uh, all those people who were coming through the army who had communications background and um, the, these individuals did anything everything from climbing uh, telephone poles to uh, repairing radios and uh, these were the people that uh, uh, I was responsible for and they, they the each class that came through was uh, probably about uh, two and a half months and how long were you with that duty assignment uh, I was there until uh, 1963 and uh, the fall of 63 mm. And then where did you go? Then I went to uh, Vietnam. Uh, looking at my record here, come before it came out of out of um, uh, out of uh, Fort Jackson. I was I was an executive officer for the battalion for a for a short short period of time there, and then I went on to uh, to Vietnam as an advisor. Uh, when we were only had a, when there were only about uh, 500 people, 400, 500 people at that time uh, in Vietnam. So we worked for the mag, for the uh, for the mag of. of and Cho Lan? No, we we, uh, we we didn't work in Cho Lan. Cho Lan was north of us. We we worked in the, I worked out of the out of the uh, the Delta area. Mekong was uh, where where our headquarters or little element was uh, stationed out of. But of course, for them, as an advisor, uh, that was the uh, you very rarely got there. You were with the uh, you were with the Vietnamese uh, unit all the time that you were advising. So that that was a that was about ten months uh, with those people. In the last two months, they pulled me out of. Uh, out of the field and uh, kept me in the headquarters for two months. I guess they, they did that to everybody. Mm -hmm. Can you remember what it was like when you first arrived over there? Did you go individually or with a group? No, you went individually. You went, uh, uh, the plane that I went over on, uh, uh, it, it was it was a plane full of uh, it, it wasn't a commercial airline. It was, it was a flight of all military people going to uh, Vietnam. But you were going. You, they, as soon as you got there, you went to different uh, locations throughout the throughout the country. And I, I still remember that that, that long flight uh, all the way to Vietnam. Uh, the number of stops we had to make. It was all it was propelling propeller plane. You could see the fire coming out of the out of the motors. Uh, or the sparks at night. Oof. My goodness, they don't do that anymore. They fly jets. <laughs> now, did you arrive at Tonsonut Airport outside of Tonsonut, Saigon? Um, uh, I'm trying to think if that was even built at that time. Uh, it, it, it was. It was. I. I tend to think I landed at the air at the airfield right uh, in Saigon. The commercial airfield, and I think they were starting to build, or they were thinking about building Tonsonut at that, you know. And the second time I went to Vietnam, yes, uh, I worked out of Tonsonut. So, how did you feel when you were being sent over there from here? Were you excited to go? Uh, yes, I, I, I was excited. I wasn't. Uh, I was young at that time. I was. Uh, not scared of anything, and uh, uh, so I, I uh, 
didn't bother me at all living in those grass shacks at uh, every night and then eating uh, Vietnamese food. Well, maybe it did. Some of the food was not the, the best in the world, but uh, hey, I got used to it and uh, we became uh, friends with the Vietnamese and uh, I can't say they were the, the best fighters in the world. They were kind of scary. Uh, they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't work at night. They hunkered up and uh, wouldn't move. <laughs> So that was the really help at her downfall, uh, I think, in, in Vietnam anyway. So you didn't eat the uh, food provided by the army? You had no. To eat the when, I, when, when, when I went back to, uh, to Mito, uh, to our uh, headquarters area, the, the Vietnamese uh, had, a, had a chef in a kitchen mm -hmm. uh, to cook food for you there. That was good food. Were there any uh, dishes you remember you particularly enjoyed? The variance was not that great. <laughs> rice? <laughs> some and <more> rice <laughs> and some kind of a chicken, or part of a chicken. You never know what you're going to wind up with, including the head. You know? <laughs> yeah. Did you ever taste any of that famous nook mom sauce? Oh, yes. Yeah, that's Can no you describe what that, that was that's like? That's right. Yeah. That, that, that's the only spice you really had on the on the, on the rice. Yeah, so. so then, uh, when you and ended, we ate a lot of natural fr na uh, fruit from the from the area. Just uh, uh, pineapple was uh, was everywhere, and the sugar cane was everywhere. What was the daily routine like assigned to the military assistance advisory group? Uh, the headquarters people, I really can't say what they did. Uh, I, as I say, I was part of a team, uh, an advisory team, which included uh, a senior officer, uh, which was a captain, uh, his assistant, which was a first lieutenant, which was myself, and then uh, we had uh, we had a, a master sergeant or a sergeant first class. Uh, as the third member of the team, and then with that team we had um, a, a person um, who spoke both uh, uh, English and uh, Vietnamese to help us uh, communicate. That that person was assigned by uh, some school in uh, in Saigon. They were well trained uh, linguist. Did you receive any kind of advisories on places to stay out of or to watch yourself uh, that there was some kind of action that m would be anticipated? No, we went, with, we, we went wherever we were assigned to go, no matter what it was. Yeah. Um, so then when your tour of duty for that was over, then where did you go? <laughs> well, it, it, uh, to go back to Vietnam, I... Uh, I don't know whether I should be talking about the battles, which are further, further down on. That's your on your there. second tour. Sure, go ahead. First tour. First oh, first tour. First tour. Go right ahead. First tour. Yeah. Uh, we were in. Uh, we were in several skirmishes in my nine months there, but uh, the the one of uh, great interest to me and uh, occurred the evening of. Uh, February 3rd through February 4th of 1963 when uh, the Viet Cong over, uh, overran our position. It was, it, it was very interesting in that I was part of a regular team, the three that I mentioned, uh, but there were several other teams that worked out of uh, Mito. The captain of one of these other teams uh, wanted to go on vacation, uh, so they assigned me to go to this unit, and it just so happened they they flew me in in helicopter at one o'clock on the third of January, which is the same evening that that they attacked, and I I didn't know anybody, you know, other than. Uh, the enlisted man that was with me, Sergeant Anderson. Uh, <laughs> never forget it. Uh, almost uh, 
it was almost the end of this kid's life. You know, we got overrun completely, and then luckily we were able to uh, to uh, they were trying to get the people to to uh, re re uh, retaliate, and uh, and uh, uh, Sergeant Anderson and I did that, and uh, we got um, we were given a bronze star for uh, valor for for getting through that night. Did you uh, take prisoners? Or were you associated no, with them? No, we didn't any? take. Uh, we uh, both of us shot some some uh, some people, some Vietnamese. What kind of medical assistance w was with you? Did you have corpsmen? No, there was no. Yeah, there was only three. Again, when you're working with a team, this time there were usually three. There was only two this night because. The captain had left, and and uh, he didn't have a he didn't have a an assistant other than a sergeant. So, really, there was only two of us, and we were brand new to uh, mm -hmm. to this. We just happened to walk in the the same day that the Viet Cong decided to to uh, attack that night. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> I can yeah. imagine. Yeah. So, so there was no no medical facilities. And, and as a to answer your question, I guess we we had uh, the only medical facility was in uh, Saigon, and if any, if you got injured, uh, they they'd fly you there to to uh, to a medical facility. And I, I uh, while there, I, I, I twice I went uh, to the hospital, uh, once with dysentery, and the other time with malaria. Uh, to the hospital in Saigon. When did you first uh, find the build-up in there? More troops coming in, and the units started getting larger. Uh, when I left in '64, they were talking about it, and really, I guess it was the, the latter part of '64 and '65 when I was uh, out of there. Back, uh, it was back in the states. Uh, the, the build-up began. So where did you go <laughs> from there you after that? Uh, from that point, uh, let's see. From that point, I went to uh, Fort Myer, uh, Virginia to the uh, 3rd Infantry Division, 1st Battalion, 3rd Infantry Division, which is a ceremonial unit for the city of uh, Washington. And uh, I, uh, I was a deputy uh, commander uh, there. And I remained a deputy uh, because they they had some people who had not been company commanders, and they they knew that I had served as a company commander already for a year and a half or almost two years at Fort Jackson. So they they gave uh, other people a chance. And as a result of that, uh, they assigned me uh, to the as the intelligence uh, person uh, for a short period of time within that unit. And then they assigned me uh, to the ceremonial and, and special events. Uh, element at the, at the Military District of Washington where I worked directly for General Herrick. And it was in that position that uh, I uh, became acquainted with uh, uh, the White House and uh, the goings on with President Johnson. And also I was responsible for all of the uh, ceremony events uh, there were two of us, uh, ceremonial events in, in Washington, D.C. 
to include uh, funerals. Um, I was there when President Hoover uh, died. Let's see, let's see. Yes, that's the only one, uh, the only funeral I did. And, I, and actually, I was uh, responsible for writing the manual that was used for uh, for funerals for uh, future presidents of the United States. So, so what was the uh, day like, say, for the funeral? What did you have to do? Uh, some of the behind scenes that maybe the rest of us wouldn't know about. No, I, I basically had a, in that position I had to coordinate with all the joint services, uh, the Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, Navy. I don't think that we had mer merchant Marines were involved uh, in, in Washington. So I had to coordinate with each one of their contact people. That's for every ceremony, mm -hmm. you know. Which, which of those elements would do what, where, mm -hmm. and at what time. And that had that responsibility because Army is the senior service. And uh, that, that because of that responsibility, that, that's why the Army was given uh, the, 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 uh, the, the lead position mm -hmm. of, of all those other services. So did you uh, have to have a parade or anything of this nature? We had ceremonies all the time. I mm -hmm. mean, uh, every time, uh, every time the, you wanted the president wanted to go somewhere, uh, um. there were uh, people uh, uh, that uh, coming and uh, and going to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. uh, all the ceremonies at the Capitol. And then even the, the president's wife, <laughs> when she had to make a little speech uh, or something in, in, in the military district of Washington area, uh, they'd have me coordinate, you know, certain things for transportation or whatever for, for those type of deals. Did you uh, normally have quite a bit of notice for these uh, events yes. or not? You did? Yes. And the only thing you wouldn't have a notice on a is funeral a funeral. Or something, right. That's right. Everything mm -hmm. else is, is, was pretty well, well planned for the, what Johnson was going to do. Uh, we, we knew well ahead of time what people were coming from what countries mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to meet him at the, at the White House and what our responsibility was. Did you have a lot of meeting with staff at the White House uh, when these events came on, so that we we had we had regular people that we that we dealt with, yes, at, the, at one at the State Department, and one at the uh, at the White House. Those were our two main contacts. Do you have any unusual re memory of anything that went on uh, in meeting with the president or the staff? <laughs> Or funny events. No, or I. Uh, well, uh, things are not funny when uh, there were there were one or two times when uh, we coordinated some service to show up, and they didn't show up, <laughs> and uh, that created a little consternation. Uh, believe it or not, uh, there was smoke <laughs> rising when things like that happened. But uh, funny things. Uh, no, I, I guess uh, uh, I, I was, well, I was, uh, before I got married, uh, I was going to be one of the aides uh, to, the, to the president uh, as a side duty. And I, was be I began training as uh, uh, what utensils you use when, where, and what things you say, and I'll never forget. I've always, I always said at, what, at the end of it, at a, if you ever say I'm full or anything like that, I was, I was directed to always say, you never say that. You always say, I've had plenty. 
I never forgot that. <laughs> it sounds like there could be a lot of stress in that job at times. <clears throat> well, I, I knew Chuck Robb. I worked with Chuck Robb, mm -hmm. and I, uh, I don't know whether you know who Chuck Robb is. He, he, was he the married US. um Son-in-law of That's President right. Johnson. Well, that was before he before he got married. Oh. Uh, that he was he was one of the uh, one of the uh, people at the White House that that, that that directed people around, which I was I was getting into when I got married. And when you once you're married, you're you're out. You have to be single in that position. Did you ever go on the presidential trip? Uh, well assigned to the protocol no. and all. I always, I always stayed in Washington. If he left, he had his, uh, his own contingent, or wherever he would go, there would be a military element that would meet him at that at that location. Did you have to coordinate anything for special ceremonies at the unknown tomb, uh, uh, the unknown soldier's tomb? and call on the, uh, the, the unit that was assigned to that duty. Yes. I, in fact, I, I can revert back before my ceremonial, because when I worked with the, the 1st Battalion, 3rd Infantry, um, that was one of my, one of my assignments, was working with the uh, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier people. And at that point, um, the president, remember the president uh, had died uh, just before I, just before, um, just before I left Vietnam. Uh, and we're talking about uh, President Kennedy. Kennedy. So he's buried at the at at uh, Arlington. Arlington, and I I had the responsibility for that gravesite. So any any time uh, someone of note uh, would come to the gravesite, uh, I would call to escort him uh, from the gate. To the gravesite, and quite a few dignitaries came through that area. Uh, one in particular I remember was Jack Benny. I don't know if I should be on this, but uh, he, he really—he um, was—he didn't look like Jack Benny when he when he walked in. That's all I could say. Uh, he, was, uh, Pretty disheveled, <laughs> but uh, you mentioned I, I didn't mention. So I, you I met a lot a few, of well-known people. Yes, then. people that came to the gravesite. Yeah. That's when the gravesite had to pick a fence around it. Oh. Yeah. Now you mentioned that uh, that duty ended when you got married; that you were transferred uh, elsewhere. So you got married. Uh, when no, I, I was still a ceremonial officer. I was I was still a ceremonial officer. Uh, in Washington, but I couldn't. I couldn't be one of the people at the exact White House uh, taking guests to dinner or living. Or really, their job was to to mingle, and they they would put you within uh, within the dining room, and they they place you next to some person who. You know, doesn't know anybody there, and your responsibility was to uh, talk to them and uh, now, did you know, that, try to get them in conversation. Now, did that kind of duty help you in your life outside uh, your personal life to know how to be a good host? <laughs> I do know what I'm supposed to do yet. I never forgot that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was per pretty funny at the time, but they they were pretty serious about uh, that training. I'll tell you that. I, su I suppose all the presidents <laughs> and their families have to learn some of these things as well. No question. And people like yourself would no, have no to help question. them. Yeah. Now, from that duty, what happened uh, 
from that interval from the duty at the Washington DC at Fort Myers and then your second tour to Vietnam? Uh, I didn't go right away to, to Vietnam. At, at that point, I, I, I decided that uh, they were talking about me going back to Vietnam and I said, I'm, I was still a little bit shaken from Vietnam and I decided, and I know it was a good decision, and I was probably looking back, it might have been a bad decision, although I'm still here living today because of it. I transferred from the infantry to uh, Quartermaster Corps. I made a branch transfer. And as a result of that, I was sent to Fort Lee, Virginia, which is the Quartermaster School or the logistics or supply school of the Army. And uh, there I, I went through uh, training as a logistician, the same thing as I did as an infantry person back at Fort Benning. And then I became uh, an instructor uh, at the school uh, for all of the classes young lieutenants coming in into the supply area. So I was there for three years, I think. At that point, I mean, after that, then I went to Vietnam. When you left uh, the States uh, to go to Vietnam, how was the transportation? Was it still, was it a more modern aircraft, <laughs> it or was, is it, it still was propeller? It was much more, it was a, a modern aircraft, much, much modern, and the the aircraft could because of the fuel I guess or something there was only uh, there was only two stops Hawaii and and the, the Philippines where prior to the first time I mean we went to Wake Island and I don't know how many other islands we we hopped all across the whole Pacific <laughs> island by island you know to get to get there the first time so it was a it was a two stopper and yeah. were you more uh Nervous about going yes. there the next time? Uh, very much so. That that, that incident uh, in 4 December of 63 changed my life dramatically. Yes, it did. In what uh, way would you like to tell her? No, it, it just, um, I, I just saw my life ending. I, I, don't why, I don't know why it didn't end that night. Uh, probably should have. It was one scary thing. So then, on your next tour, then uh, next tour, I was I was in the logistics. Mm -hmm. I wasn't. I was. You would uh, hope you'd be more protected. No, uh, but at, 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 when I went back the second time, I mean, the first time there were 500 people. The second time, I don't know how many how many thousands were were in Vietnam in '68 and '69. I mean, at that point. There were all regular units, the, the Army, uh, the Marines, they all, everyone had their regular units uh, in there. Whereas the first time, basically, there were no units whatsoever. There were just little old advisors walking around the, uh, the rice paddies or the mountains, you know. Did you find when you landed, was it extremely hot compared with where you'd been here or not? I've often Vietnam, heard Vietnam. Vietnam is is, is a warm is a warm right, country. I've but I but uh, it, it uh, I mean I've actually been hotter at night at, at Fort Bragg and in Fort Lee, Virginia, than I have been in in in, in, uh, in Vietnam. To be honest, truth. Because I've heard sometimes it would be so hot landing at the uh, airport runways in Vietnam when men weren't used to it. No, I wouldn't. You I, were uh, no, fortunate was, on that no. then. Mm -hmm. Some of the worst nights I ever lived through was at Fort Lee, and of course we didn't have air; we just had fans, and and uh, you just lay in a bed and sweat, mm -hmm. you know, because of the humidity, and right. it was terrible in in, in Virginia, <laughs> absolutely terrible. <laughs> so now we're back in Vietnam again. Back in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And this time I, I didn't, uh, my position was in the actual headquarters um, 
for all of Vietnam were, uh, you know, so I, I was uh, responsible for the automated su supply system which was going into, uh, into Vietnam. These were uh, trailers uh, that uh, uh, had, which were uh, probably the initial autom automation for actual uh, movement uh, and the gathering of, of supplies. So uh, it was a lot easier the second time uh, uh, in, in Vietnam. And where uh, was, near what town was this headquarters? The, the headquarters was there. right at Tonson Hood Air Force okay, Base. Right at the base. Yeah, where the, where the big headquarters was, mm -hmm. right. Did you do traveling back and forth to other locations from there? A little bit, yes, we did. But I mean, uh, Tonson Oak was, was not a, uh, you know, you got mortars in there, you, you, you know, I wouldn't say nightly, but maybe once every uh, three or four weeks, uh, you know, the, the mortars would come pretty close to where you were living uh, at Tonson Oak. But, that was nothing like uh, the first time. Mm -hmm. I assume there was an awful lot of traffic coming in, both aircraft and oh, from yes. the sea, oh, uh, it, supplies it. coming by way of the no, sea? No question. no question about it. That's right. And did yeah. you have contact Huge with... Huge operation. Uh, contact and uh, acquainting uh, incoming personnel to what not, to expect? Not really. No. No, I was... This time I was, at a, I was in a headquarters element and... Uh, I was far from the far from the actual people that were that were doing the you know the the, the grunts that were moving the, the materials. I had I had all, all I knew was where the automation elements were, whether they were working, and if they needed to be need to be repaired. And I would coordinate uh, to have uh, uh, these civilian people come in and uh, and fix the. Uh, fix the automated systems. The second tour of duty, was that uh, just a selection? It wasn't a voluntary thing on your part to go for it? No. For a second it tour? It was go to Vietnam. Yeah, it was my, my time to go again. Yeah. At that time, was there a maximum number of tours that you were expected to perform in Vietnam? No, I, I know some people that went uh, three times. But I think the majority of the people only went once, to be honest truth. I, the reason I went mm -hmm. twice is because I was, I went before they even, you know, geared up on Vietnam. So I, I was there right off the bat, one of the first to go in there. So that's why they grabbed me uh, the second time. And you, how long were you there on this next tour? A year. A year again. Mm -hmm. yeah. Had you seen much change, or were you too isolated? Um, no, I was. It was like apples and oranges, as I say. I was sitting in an air-conditioned, beautiful, big headquarters. Mm -hmm. You know that that uh, was well guarded by uh, military police, and it was it was like night and day. Yeah, totally night and day. Mm -hmm. By chance, did you get to meet? Uh, uh, like the commander was it General Westmoreland uh, over there? Um, no. Were there many VIPs that came through to see what was going on? Um, if they did, I didn't see it. You know that that they probably had a, an own echelon that that that, uh, that monitored. I'm sure they were. You know, these congressmen always uh, do things like that. You know, they're, they're doing it in Iraq, you know, in Iraq like now, you know. So. And I suppose that they come there quite well protected. Very well, I would think. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I really didn't see. Right. I didn't, I didn't, I'm just surmising. And I take it this time you had uh, food that was uh, oh, yes. more palatable. This, this was wonderful food. <laughs> American food, American mainly? food, that's right. <laughs> Do they have entertainment uh, provided like USO shows? We yes, heard a lot. Yes, they did. Yep. By chance? And I, yes, I did, and I saw Bob Hope. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what was it uh, yeah. like 
Did you enjoy it? Oh, I, of course I was, uh, there was such a number of people uh, that, uh, and, and they brought they brought the regular units in. So us people from the, from the palace, uh, we were kind of asked to, uh, you know, get into the background right. because they really want, they really want, and, and, it, and it's right, the, the people that were being fired at every day, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they were right up at the, at the front of the. Mm -hmm. Well, they needed that big. That's right, certainly did. So where I, where I saw Bob Hope was, I, I hate to even think how far it was. <laughs> At least a hundred yards, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you needed That's strong right, binoculars. Yeah. That's right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they brought all the beautiful women yes, and everything. Yeah. And the they're manager. all there. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's right. It's quite a show. He puts on a great show. You, he did. Yeah. What a wonderful person Bob yeah. Oak was. Mm -hmm. yeah. You had mentioned that one of your duties was as a protocol officer for the United Nations. Could you describe what that was uh, involved? Okay, that was my... When I, no, wait a minute, let's see, where was I? When I, when I came back uh, from Vietnam, I went to, uh, see how that was. Uh, uh, well, let, me, let me tell you, on my list in here, I, I, I really have not monitored my service. <laughs> Uh, over the years. Well, you had a longer career. <laughs> uh, Can you recall what your rank was at the second tour? Um, I was a captain. No, I'm sorry. I was a major. Major. I was a major. Um, Okay, from there, I went to Philadelphia, and I was the deputy commander of the U.S. Army Support Center in Philadelphia. Uh, and the support center there was had overall responsibility for soup to nuts for uh, the Army, from food to clothing to metals to anything any type of uh, that would involve for things for the personal boots, shoes, mm -hmm. soup to nuts as far as uh, providing whatever the individual soldier needed. Right. That's what we did at Philadelphia. Uh, and that was, uh, there were just two, two of us there, a lieutenant colonel and myself. So then when you finished your work there, where from, did you From go? there, then I, then I went on, uh, I, I went on to Fort Hamilton. And that, I, at, at that point, I, I detected that, you know, I made that decision about going into logistics that uh, maybe that wasn't the best assignment to do, but it kept me alive. Uh, but when I got my next assignment at Fort Hamilton, I knew at that point that I was not heading on the line up the road to Command and General Staff College. Uh, my assignment at Fort Hamilton, as I related to you, that I was responsible for the ceremonies at uh, Washington DC well now they put me as responsible for the foreign military people who come and go to the United Nations so I had a uh, I had about uh, 10 people 8 to 10 people uh, 
mainly which were drivers. Uh, and I coordinated uh, with people at Washington as far as what dignitaries and, and the State Department, which dignitaries were coming in, foreign dignitaries uh, to the United Nations, which were going to be going on to Washington, D.C. Normally, they, they, they brought people in to New York to wine and dine them uh, before sending uh, those people on to the State Department and, and, uh, and the Capitol uh, in, in, in Washington. So that was my responsibility, getting them in here, getting them over to the United Nations, and uh, which was a real Benny, is uh, going to some very exclusive restaurants to wine and dine all these uh, foreign generals from you mm -hmm. name the country, they came through. You know. Did you have an interpreter with you? Yes. The, 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 although a lot of the a lot of the dignitaries, when, when you get to be general in those countries, yeah. uh, they they know quite a few languages, mm -hmm. you know, and a lot of them a lot of them could converse in English. Very very few, very few could not uh, converse uh, in, in English. Uh, Going back, uh, so as not to leave some, it undone, can you describe what the feeling was like when you second tour ended in Vietnam and you came back to the States? What was the mood of the country like? What was it like over there when you left? Uh, well, at, at that point, uh, you know, we had, we had seen what was going on uh, uh, with all of the uh, people who were against the war, and uh, it, it was in the newspapers. It was it was quite prominent, and uh, really it made you feel bad uh, for you know here's trying to support your your nation and support your government, and uh, to see uh, the people who were dodging the the system and also who were uh, really creating. Uh, Disloyalty, burning flags. I, I just that was that was I guess the start of, of uh, where flag burning began, and they still do it today, and they get away with it. Just very discouraging to me. When you left Vietnam, were you relieved, happy, joyful? Anytime you leave Vietnam, yes. you're joyful. <laughs> the first time was I could have walked on water, I think, to get out of there. You know, the second time was. Was, it was good, but not as not as uh, not as wonderful as the first time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I I see that uh, reviewing some of the information you supplied us that you earned uh, a Legion of Merit, a Bronze Star with two oak leaves, Meritorious Service Medal with two oak leaves, Army Commendation, uh, one oak leaf. Uh, yes. Uh, um, were there a special ceremonies when you received these yes. awards? Each one of the, I had a ceremony at each one of those. Mainly, mainly I had a ceremony at each one of the uh, each one of the uh, bronze stars and uh, and the Legion of Merit, which the Legion of Merit was for my retirement from the army. I, I received that for for my service for twenty years in the army. So. Uh his next tour of duty, did you leave from Fort Hamilton? Was that the last assignment, or did you have some after that? No, I had, I had, I had other assignments. Uh, from, from, Fort, uh, from Fort Hamilton, I went on to Fort Devens, and I was the director of logistics at, uh, at Fort Devens, uh, which is in Massachusetts. The big thing in uh, at Fort Devens was the security school. Uh, these are the, are the, the, the spies, <laughs> or the, the I guess the, the people. Uh, these are the ones who uh, work with codes, uh, uh, 
things of that nature. Uh, the, the secretive part of, of communications throughout the Army. Uh, and all I was doing at that point was uh, providing uh, the support for, again, this was a training activity with, with classes of people uh, coming through. Uh, these people, of course, were very intelligent. Uh, we were pick of pick the crop uh, uh, intellectuals as far as uh, uh, their responsibilities, what they were going to be doing in the future. So. And then after Fort De Devens? And well, at Fort Devens, my life changed uh, drastically. I was caught in a reduction of force at Fort Devens, and uh, I was reduced to a uh, chief warrant officer. And I spent uh, my last two assignments as a chief warrant officer, uh, both at um, as a combat battalion at, at Fort Knox and also at Schofield Barracks in Hawaii. So uh, I was a uh, property book officer. I was responsible for, uh, in Hawaii, for all the aircraft uh, that uh, were, under, were on my property book for the, for the Pacific. And in the engineer battalion, I had uh, I had all of the all of the equipment within a engineer battalion has, which is numerous bulldozers, anything involving with uh, engineering type of equipment. So I retired as a uh, chief warrant officer from the service, but after ten years. Uh, out of the service, you're re-promoted to a major, and that's that's my rank today. And how did um, the military affect your life uh, once you were out of the military? Did you keep uh, join any of these organizations, or I haven't work into any? Yeah, I really, I really haven't. Mm -hmm. I was a little disgruntled about uh, my. Uh, at the end of my two careers in, in, in the service because uh, I felt that uh, I had served well. But when, when you have a major reduction, when we had the great buildup in Vietnam, you, some people have to go, you know. And I, I sent, uh, I sent, when I got that fort, uh, that, that assignment at Fort Hamilton, that I wasn't going on, I was not heading up the, the route that I should be going, and boy, that's what happened. Luckily, mm -hmm. a lot of the people who were uh, not re, uh, lost in reduction of force, they, they could never get back in the service. Luckily, uh, they, they saved me to, uh, to be a warrant officer for, uh, for three years, mm -hmm. four years. So I, let me, that, that let me, uh, Retired, retired at least. Right, that's right. Well, I see you didn't really retire because you went to work at the Waterfleet Arsenal that's that correct. makes the armaments for the services. That's exactly right. What kind of uh, work? Supply were you again, or logistics. <laughs> <laughs> Walked into that, and then uh, I was I was uh, I worked uh, in the in the supply division for uh, eight years, and then again twelve years I was in manage I was in management division. Uh, at, at the uh, at the arsenal. Mm -hmm. So then you retired uh, completely from the arsenal. And retired uh, last September. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, we thank you very much okay. for sharing your story with us. And while I was at while I was at the arsenal, forget we uh, uh, I I knew several of the people uh, that are at the museum in. Um, in Saratoga. Uh, so, hi to you people. <laughs> <laughs> okay.